We've worked out the force acting along the normal, okay? That's good, we, we know it's going in this way, okay? But conversely, in just the same way that if you start with a projectile, right? Like this, right? And then you're like, oh, what's happening over here? And then you just use trick, it's all fine, okay? A natural question to ask is, well, what's happening over here? to the perpendicular axis. Now, what would you call, this is the normal axis that I've got in green, what would you call the other axis that's perpendicular to that? It's the tangential axis, okay? Now, we're going to draw this again. Because this diagram is going to get so busy, I recommend, I've seen textbooks, they try and jam it into one. I'm going to ask you to draw this diagram again, but instead of having the normal axis in here, I want to compare it to this tangential axis, and we'll find something really interesting. Now it's worth pointing out, even though I'm focusing on this guy, the tangential axis, I still need, and maybe you want to put this in like dotted or something like that, I still need the normal axis in there because my angle, my angular displacement kind of depends on the normal. That's where it's measured from. Okay? So just in light dots, I'm going to put in this guy to the center. Okay? I've got my angular displacement theta in there. Right? Now think about the triangles we drew over here. I drew these triangles because I was trying to match up the horizontal and vertical bits to the normal. But this time, I'm trying to match up the horizontal and vertical bits to the tangent. So I'm going to get a different pair of triangles. Do you see that? Different pair of triangles? Here's the pair of triangles I'm going to get. For the horizontal bit, that's a bad X. For the horizontal bit, I'm going to come down this way to the tangential axis. Make sense? And then for the vertical bit, I'm going to come down this way again, to the tangential axis. And now I need to work out with trig, what's going on in here, okay? Here's my angle theta. So tell me, where can I find theta in this diagram? How would you like to describe it to me? Okay, so the theta, theta, the first place I'm gonna see it, just like I did before, is just with corresponding angles. This is the x-axis, this is the x-force. So therefore, by corresponding angles, I see theta in there. Does that make sense? So that makes this the complement of theta, which means pi on 2 minus theta, which means theta is up in this corner. Does that make sense? Theta. Okay. So now can you tell me, again, by trig and thinking about the, um, the right ratios and which sides you're interested in, that's f of x and that's the side I'm interested in, what ratio links this side and that side? Look sine. carefully. It's going to be sine, right? Here's your theta. That's opposite and that's the hypotenuse. Okay, so if you go ahead, you can redraw again the same diagrams, but I'm going to save you a bit of time. Uh, this here, which is, I'm going to call this T for tangential part from X, that's going to be, I believe, Fx sine theta. That's that bit, because sine theta will be uh, opposite on hypotenuse. And in the same way, have a look over here. Okay, where's theta? Where's theta? Tell me where theta is. If this is theta, this must be the complement of theta, right? Because right angles. And then you've got another right angle. So that makes this back to theta. Does that make sense? Theta, right there. So now I'm trying to connect this side here, which is adjacent to theta, with this guy here, which is the hypotenuse, Fy. Right? So you can see for adjacent, hypotenuse, it's cos. So this part here, Ty, right, is going to be f of y cos theta. So far, so good. So I'm basically rehearsing this, but because we um, drew the diagrams before, I'm sort of going through it a little quicker. Okay, now the wonderful thing about this is, have a look at these guys, right? Can you see they're both heading in the same direction? Both heading, so that's why I added them, right? I added them. But look at these guys. They are necessarily heading in opposite directions. So therefore, when I was working out the force of the normal, capital N, the force of the normal, I added, but when I'm working, the, working out the force along the tangential axis, I have to subtract one from the other. Does that make sense? So I'm going to say, well, that's, that's looking like it's in the positive direction. Actually, it doesn't really matter, as you'll see in a second. So I'm going to say f of, uh, yeah. Actually, hold on. Which way did I write it? I think I wrote this one first. OK, there's that one. And I'm going to subtract it from this one. OK, can you see they're facing in opposite directions? So that's why I subtract. How do you know that Just have a look at the directions that my arrows are facing in. Have a look at the directions that my arrows are facing in with respect to this tangent. Okay? It doesn't matter all that much, as you will see in a second. Just watch. Uh, what is f of y cos theta? Well, this is f of y over here. 
right? So when I multiply that guy by cos theta, it looks to me like it'll be minus mr omega squared sine theta cos theta. Okay, then I have to subtract. And when you multiply that guy by sine theta, you're going to get minus mr omega squared cos theta sine theta. Cos theta sine theta. Hold on a second. Uh, same, 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 same. It's zero. Huh. Force along the normal. Headed towards the center. Proportional to all of these things. Force along the tangent, zero? What does that mean? It's the force along the tangent being zero to me. Because there's no acceleration. Huh. So, think about this, right? The reason I asked you to reorient these diagrams is so that you can think in terms of what's happening along here versus what's happening along here. Okay? Now, tell me what happens if you're experiencing a force of zero. What would that mean to you? You are either, now, now, now the Newton's first law is in play, right? You are either stationary, because you've lost zero and it's not changing, or you're moving in constant straight line motion, constant straight line motion. But hold on, didn't we just say it's constantly changing direction, right? So how come this is constantly not changing direction? Aha! Uh -huh. Wait, hold on. Wait, no, because the tangent one. is changing. All right. So the tangential axis it keeps on moving, right? So therefore, what this means is, right? You're experiencing inertia here. So we call this. We said this in the very first lesson, and I said, "Be patient," right? We call this an inertial frame of reference, right? Because if you picture yourself, right? Sitting here, okay, like what is what was that person on the edge doing? That person on the edge, what they were experiencing is they're just running forwards. We're with relation to this tangent, the tangent keeps changing, but you are always running forwards. Does that make sense? So therefore, for uniform circular motion, you've got this, which is um just meaning you're going the same speed all the way around, and then you've got this, which is holding you and making you move in a circle rather than flying off, like the discus did. Did that make sense? Okay. So, huge ideas. Now, let me just come back. I remember I said for homework, right? When we went through this whole process to work out uh, these guys, when we went through this whole process, we could regard omega as a constant. Why could we do that again? Tell me why. <laughs> uniform circular motion. Uniform circular motion. But not all circular motion is uniform. So my homework for you, um, you could do it now if you'd like, is if omega is in fact a function and not just a constant, this step will be the same. Do you notice? This step will be the same, right? This has no omegas in it. You have to bring omega in. No big deal. So all of this is fine. But our next step will be very different. What's going to happen in our next step to get to acceleration? Okay. I, obviously, I had to use chain rule. I'm going to have to do that. But in addition to that, this is not just um, a constant, a constant, and a function. This is going to be a function times another function. So we're going to have to do product rule. Now you can see why I didn't start with that example. Some textbooks start with non-uniform yeah. circular motion. I'm like, are you that's nuts? <laughs> right? Yeah, that's right. I think it's so much easier to think about it just as a constant. Now that you've gone through this and see all, all the way we did it in a simple version, when this is not changing, I do want you to go through. The result you'll get at the end is not that complicated. But I want you to go through, having done, you'll need product rule here. Okay. So, we've got um, just under 20 minutes to go. Um, what I'd like you to do is to open up your um, laptops, if you haven't already. I emailed you, emailed you out, um, remember before I gave you 7.1, 7.2? So I have now given you 7.3 through to the end of the chapter. Um, I'd like you to either give the first two questions a go. Give the first two questions a go. I'm pretty sure they're uniform circular motion, so you don't need to do this just yet. Um, or alternatively, you can have a go at this now while it's still fresh in your mind. Okay? To try and rehearse this whole thing, treating omega as a function, not as a number. I um, I spend most of my days trying not to imagine the resistance circular motion. Um, now, 
one last thing before I relax. Um, one last thing before I um. Um, one last thing before I get you all started. Remember I said to you, oh, it's like two dimensions again. Look, two dimensions, X and Y's, obviously. But actually, it's sort of two and a half dimensions. So here's a simple example. Um, yeah, okay. Um, picture a table. Picture a table, okay. And then picture, like, um, the center of the string of a string here. And then there's an object which, um, through some mysterious, like, in inanimate force, okay, is moving in uniform circular motion around this, okay? Now, this is a very simple question. So you can see all of the motion is happening in two dimensions, yeah? All the motion is happening in two dimensions. But in order to understand mass, mass matters, right? Um, <laughs> mass matters. Uh, you're on a table, you're on a table. So therefore, in what direction is the mass force acting in? And the answer is, it's acting through the table, right? We call it weight, right? Weight. Um, of course, because you've got a, a force acting downwards, right? Have a look at all these objects that are on the table on which a weight force is acting, but they're not moving. Why aren't they moving? Because there's a reaction force. So here's, here's um, weight, gravity, right? Not to be confused with omega. Then you've got this reaction force up here, which is acting in a direction perpendicular to your surface. Does that make sense? And so that's why these two balance each other out, and up and down, no motion is happening. So it's 3D, but uh, this dimension up here, you're not worrying about any motion in that dimension, okay? But your diagram will be included. That's why it's two and a half. That's why it's two and a half, okay? So that third dimension, that's third spatial dimension, I'm not worrying about any change there, so that's why I had to account for it, but then once I've dealt with it, I don't worry about it. 